identity. And that's how it should be. That's what happens if you're a civilized person, is the context defines your identity. Period. The end. Yeah, and then the, the strange thing that layers on top of that is that not only are they saying that how you feel defines who you are, they're saying that it defines who you are, that you're a woman or you're a man. When those are just right. about the most, you know, concrete things about us, the most non-negotiable things about us, the most bedrock things about us, like far more than our IQ. Well, they might be the most bedrock thing about us, right? Which maybe yeah. is why the culture war is centering on this issue. Because if yeah. it is a war between epistemology and ontology, or between, let's say, narcissistic delusion and reality itself, then the battle devolves to identity on the grounds of sex, right? Is what did, what did Freud say? Biology is destiny. Yeah, and I mean, I don't believe that entirely. Well, it, it isn't true entirely. Well, we, on top of biology, we have, you know, we have got this civilization that we've built, and it's very, it's very anchored to biology, of course it is, but it is also to some extent malleable, like we do co-negotiate it in different societies to some extent on top of that. But then to have this idea that a man can say, I wish I was a woman, or I feel like I'm really a woman, or I think I'm a woman inside, which are things that only a man can say. I can't wish to be a woman. I can't feel like I should have been a woman. Those are things that are only possible for men. And then those things are meant to make you a woman. And then it's so detached from reality that there's, there's no tether. It can go anywhere. Like, this can just float off to anything at all. And that's why we see this weird proliferation of, you know, a poorer gender or somebody being grey sexual or something. You know, it's got, it's got, it goes off into sort of almost stamp collecting levels of, of precision and difference and so on. Well, there's another issue that comes up there too, is, is so, and it, this is relevant to your claim, which is entirely warranted, that we're, we vary on top of our biology. And so, for example, there is a lot of biological and socially constructed variance in temperament on top of biological sex. And so you, you could say without fear of error that a reasonable percentage of boys have a feminine temperament. And so that would mean they're, they have more negative emotion, they're more compassionate, and they're more interested in people than in things. Those are the cardinal differences between the masculine and the feminine. And a non-trivial number of boys have those characteristics, just like a non-trivial number of girls are less compassionate and polite, so more competitive, let's say. They're more emotionally stable, and they're more interested in things. Now, those are relatively rare girls and relatively rare boys, but statistically, they're hardly, uh, what would you say? They're hardly, they're not so rare that you don't see them all the time. It might be 10% of boys are essentially feminine in their temperament, 10% of girls, and that's a lot. And what that should, and so that's at the level of temperament, which is really where gender should be conceptualized, because there are no good measures of gender. There are good measures of temperament and interest that differentiate men and women. Like if you, if you use measures of temperament, including interest, you can reliably identify someone as a man or a woman about 80% of the time, something mm -hmm. like that. So you can do it 50-50 on the basis of chance. And with the, good, with the best measurements we have, you can get that up to 75, 25, or 80, 20. But that's certainly by no means perfect identification. And so one of the things that's perverse about this too, isn't it, is that despite the claims of the radicals that identity is socially constructed and variable, their fundamental notion is that if you have a variable temperament, so if you're a feminine boy, then what that means is that your biological reality is out of sync. Yes. Because the biology is so fundamentally important in that case, but never in any other case. Yes, yes, yeah, it's yes, so yes. It's so incoherent, man. It's unreal. It, 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 completely. And I mean, also, if we were to say, which would be a terrible thing to say, and I don't say it, if we were to say that this 10 or 20% of boys who are actually, statistically speaking, more like the standard for girls, if we were to say, well, actually, they're really girls, that's not what yeah. we're seeing. There's no objective claim here. That would at least be semi-objective. It would be absolutely repulsive as well. They're just slightly out of the ordinary boys, you know? But it's the, the people who are claiming that a man can tell you he's a woman or a woman can tell you she's a man. You know, there's no, there's no way you could say, no, nah, you're actually just very like a man, so you can't be a woman. Like, in particular, he could be a rapist, which is the most masculine thing, you know? So we don't even say that a trans woman who commits rape thereby 
demonstrates that this claim to be in some gendered way really a woman has, has, has been disproved. Yes, yeah, so in your book you also talk about, oh yes, yeah, so there's another element that's at work here too, and that, and that is the, uh, the trans transformations are also on the cutting edge of um, a, a transhumanism that's also yes. aimed at the, in some sense, at the eradication of death itself, right? So there's another utopian dream that's sitting underneath this, which has its positive element, I would say, too, because we are trying to improve the length of our life and to rejuvenate ourselves. And there's an open question here is, well, how far can the transformations of our identity go in an increasingly technological world? And how far should they go? And so, and the transhumanist types who, who believe, for example, that our consciousness could be uploaded into a computer and that we could be propagated forever, also have a proclivity to fall into the camp that says that your identity is only what you say it is, right? It's this soul idea that's, that's independent of the body, and there's a wish in that to be free of the chains and constraints of, of mortal existence. And, and you can understand that as well, but it's... But running away from something into fantasy is not the way to address it. I mean, it is a fantasy, isn't it? And it's a fantasy that's rather similar to being of the opposite sex. The fantasy that, you know, you can control death itself, that life and death are in your hands. It's the fantasy of being a god, not just being immortal, but being a god. And sometimes people express that as, um, you know, terribly light ways to talk about what are major operations. like. Anyone who's been through sex reassignment surgery, as it's called, although of course we can't actually reassign sex, will tell you that this was a major operation. And the question of how, um, how content you are with the outcome depends a lot on how realistic your ideas about it beforehand were. So if you're someone who's lived with gender dysphoria for many years and you do it, then you know, it, it may actually just make you feel a bit better. But if you thought you could be turned into the opposite sex, you will be disappointed because these are, we are not made of meat Lego. I also don't think that the data that this actually makes people feel better is really very clear. I, no, isn't. I'm not sure at all that the tiny minority of people that we help, first of all, are truly helped. Yeah. Um, because there's so much idiot ideology obscuring this and so much self-deception and narcissism on the part of the people who are doing it and undertaking it that we don't have clear data. But what we bloody well do know is that a huge number of people who are doing this have been pulled into a psychogenic fad and then are undergoing unbelievably dangerous hormonal transformation because hormones are no joke. They are powerful physiological agents. And then the surgery itself is, well, it couldn't, it, if the only way it could be more brutal in a fundamental sense is if it was done without anesthetic. Right? This is not something you waltz into for one day and, and, uh, and then like it's a minor modification of some trivial element of your identity. These but are life-changing procedures. It is. It's I know, I know, exactly. Children as well. You know, that you can go through the opposite yeah. sex puberty or that, you know, the, the, the wilder reaches of the, the trans lobby will talk about things like putting all children on puberty blockers until we grow up enough that we decide which puberty we want to undergo. And I mean, I, I was brought up Catholic. I'm no longer a believer at all, but I, I listen to this and I just think that's, that's demonic, actually. It's, it's, it's a hell of a evil. thing for an ex-Catholic to say. Yeah, you know. yeah, but I, I don't well, you think so, so. To say that to children, to give children that idea. I think, you know, whoever, whosoever misleads one of these children, you know, it's yeah, the worst thing yeah, you can do. Yeah. And they do, yeah. all the time. Well, so, well, so let me ask you about this then. You know, one of the things that I have noticed is that people tend to come to religious convictions not so much when they discover the nature of good, but when they discover the nature of evil and the reality of evil. And you call, you know, you described yourself as a lapsed Catholic, let's say, but you've been talking about the battle that's been happening right now in religious and theological terms, and I think that indicates the depth of the battle. And then also making the case that while the willingness to sacrifice children to the dictates of a narcissistic ideology borders on the demonic, it's pretty strong language for someone who's not religious. And so one of the things I've been concerned about is that when God dies, to use the Nietzschean phrase, that, and we no longer attribute to God what is God's and attribute to Caesar what is Caesar's, we start to attribute to Caesar what is God's. 
And that contaminates the political with the religious. And so I think that even if you're a secularist, you have to start to understand, if you're sophisticated, that some elements of the axioms of perception and cognition themselves are so deep, they're so fundamental, that they're outside the realm of the political. They might even be outside the realm of the philosophical. They're down in the realm of the sacred. I was and that's true that whether word. you're Okay, okay, so why? Why, what, given your lapsed Catholic state, let's say, it, it's weird, right? Because there's this, there's this ambivalence in, in your conceptualization. I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel ambivalent. agnostic about this. Yeah. But, okay, okay, so I'd yeah. like to hear about, about that. So I don't describe myself as a lapsed Catholic because really I just don't believe at all anymore. But the reason I don't believe is that I don't think it's true. It's not because I can't feel the emotional and spiritual content of what's being said. It's that I think it's factually false. And maybe that just shows my lack of poetry and imagination as a human being, but I can't get past it anyway. However, I do think that there is something sacred in the creation of a new life by a couple and a mother who grows a baby for nine months. I've done it twice. It was. It's not something that you could or should talk about in monetary or financial or economic terms, or even in prosaic everyday terms. It's something extraordinary. It's it's a miracle. In secular terms, you, you've, you've done something miraculous. And then children are such precious little things, you know? Like I feel that as a mother. I feel it as a sister of eight younger siblings, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as now an aunt to 19 children, you know? It's... It's not something that we should treat so lightly. And I, because I was brought up Catholic as an Irish Catholic, the language that I turn to, I have no other language to use for how seriously I take the wrong that is being done. Look, in my, in my clinical practice, it was always the case that when I was dealing with the most fundamental catastrophes of people's lives or the most profound experiences of their lives, that the language would automatically become religious. Yes. And that was the case even if the people that I were, was talking to were explicitly a religious or secularist. And the reason for that is that we actually have a domain of deep language. And when we fall into the domain of deep language, we're in the domain of the sacred. And I've been trying to think about that technically. So imagine this, you know, we have this notion of literary depth, right? Some stories are shallow, some stories are deep. Okay, and everyone feels that and everyone pretty much accepts the fact that same with music, the same with beauty, any art form, there's shallow aspects and there are deep aspects. And deep aspects move you yes. and they move you deeply. So they have emotional resonance and they call to you as well, right? They call you to a better version of yourself. And part of the depth, so imagine that the deeper an idea is, is precisely proportionate to the number of other ideas that, that, I, that depend on that idea. What? Right, and so then as we move down into the depths and we start talking about, well, the category of sex, for example, or that, that stellar purity and attractiveness of children, which you really see if you can see children, you're way down in the depths when you see that. That's how children reward you for having them, right, is that there's such a responsibility and such a miracle at the same time that the miracle of the relationship that you can have with them amply repays you for the responsibility if you are if you can only see it. But then you have to go down into the depths and take that relationship as a sacred reality and, and ethical requirement. And yeah, you deal with those things casually at your great peril. And, and it's funny, I mean, I said that you don't use the language of economics about them, but I mean, there is something I often think, and I say it in a jokey way, but I'm completely serious too. I mean, a child is the ultimate non-fungible good. Right. So fungible things are the things that it doesn't matter which one it is. One gold piece of gold bullion is the same as another. One barrel of oil is the same as another. One child is not the same as another. And if you lose a child, you can't replace that child. So why is that? Like, why do we feel like that? Well, obviously, in my opinion, evolution gave it to us. Uh, a religious person might conceive of that differently. But the feeling is the same, and I find now, in ways that before I found this topic, I have fruitful and interesting, to me at least, conversations with religious people, because they take this seriously. To them, you know, to, they feel a sense of awe at God. Well, right, that awe of awe. Well, what you see, I think, when you have a relationship with a child, your own child in particular, because you can see them most clearly in some real sense is that you see the 
manifestation of the image of God. I mean, to me, it's the it's, it's evolution is the thing that did that. But evolution gives That's me that same sense of awe. You know, you don't. It's it's not something you treat lightly. It's not something that isn't miraculous. And this seems like maybe we've gone off topic a lot. But I think it's why mothers and people who care.